my name is Elizabeth Palmer and I am a PhD student here at the Range Cattle Research and Education Center working with Dr. Felipe Moriel. So I started my program in August of 2018 and since then I've been able to work on various studies that have investigated different pre-calving supplementation strategies for Boss Indicus influenced cows and not only the effect that it has on their reproduction but also the impact that it has on their offspring. So I'm really excited to share with you today some of the results from the studies that we've conducted here recently. I will be taking questions at the end, so please you can put them in your the questions box as we move forward, um, but I will get to them and save them all for the end. So first I want to start by talking today about the nutrient requirements for grazing beef cows that weigh around 1100 pounds and produce 20 pounds per day of milk. First, I'll orient you to the graph. The dotted red lines are the cow's requirements for energy, whereas the dotted blue lines are their requirements for protein. The solid blue line is the amount of crude protein in Bahia grass, while the solid red line is the amount of energy in Bahia grass. So we see two areas, two clear areas here. In the green, this is when the Bahia grass provides adequate protein and energy for grazing beef cows. Now the red is when we start to see deficiencies in both protein and energy in grazing beef cows. Now this starts in October, which is about the end of gestation and is through November through February. And no, here, at least at the research station and in most of Florida, we start calving in November and through the winter months. So this is could be a problem when the behavior grass is not meeting the energy requirements. Now at the, at the research station, we really focus on one key area, at least the research I've been conducting in the last couple of years, and it's the late gestation period, which for us would start in August through September and October. Now you might ask us, why are we starting to supplement in August and October when there's plenty of Bahia grass and it's also meeting the cow's energy and protein requirements. Well, as we go through this presentation, you'll see that just subtle changes in the nutrient status of the cow can have significant effects, not only on their reproduction, but also on the impact that they have on their calf. And then we look here on this um, last month, last 30 to 40 days of gestation in October, when we're actually deficient in protein and energy. And there's been research that has shown that just minor changes and short-term um, energy restrictions can have long-term implications on the calf. So the reason for this is called fetal programming. So here at the center, we are really interested in how the maternal's environment and in our case in particular, how maternal nutrition influences the calf in utero. So once we look at the development of the calf in utero, how the calf is developed in utero can have long-term effects on the health of the calf, on their pre and post weaning or, uh, growth, as well as their carcass quality. So today I'm going to try to hit a bunch of these topics. And I'm gonna start by talking about research that's been done primarily in Boss Taurus or English breeds and is done in the Midwest to Northern regions of the United States where they're grazing cool season grasses. But then we're going to move into talking about the studies that we've been doing here in subtropical environments with Boss Indicus influenced genetics, as well as grazing warm season, low quality forages. So first I would like to start by talking about calf health. So this was a study done in the Midwest region of the United States, and this group actually did a collection of studies that we're going to get to in the, in the um, next couple of slides. But to start with this, they supplemented one pound per day of a protein supplement during the entire length of late gestation. And then they followed the calves from birth until slaughter. And what they looked at was the percentage of steers that were treated for either gastrointestinal or respiratory diseases from birth to weaning and then from weaning to slaughter. So when we look at the difference, there's no difference in the percent of steers treated from birth to weaning. It's about 18 to 18.5%. But now when we look from weaning to slaughter, steers that were born to cows that received no prepartum protein supplementation were treated a 10% more 
than cat or steers that were um, born to cows that received uh, protein supplementation during the entire length of late gestation. This could have significant economic implications because, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this can have significant economic implications because sick calves will have reduced performance in the feed yard and it can also affect their carcass quality at time of slaughter. Additionally, you have the added cost of antibiotic treatment with additional treat, uh, treatments in the feedlot. Another study looked at providing two different protein supplements, or two different, sorry, two different energy um, requirements. And this was actually conducted by Dr. Moriel when he was still at North Carolina State University. So the first treatment provided 100% of the energy requirements during the last 40 days of gestation. The second study provided only 70% of the daily energy requirements. Now, when we look at the body condition score at calving, so 40 days after they started this supplement or this um, nutritional strategy, you see that there's no difference in body condition score between the two treatments. Additionally, the cows that were provided 70% of their nutrient requirements only lost 0.25 body condition score. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was out looking at the field, this may not be something that I pick up on very easily going from a 6.6 .6 to a 6.4. This is something that you would have to be out there almost every day recording body condition score and um, really checking, checking your records. So even this subtle difference can have effects on their calf. And what they saw was that um, calves that were born to cows that received 70% of their energy requirements had lower antibody titers for bovine viral diarrhea virus, which is one of the viruses associated with bovine respiratory disease. So this goes to show that just this short-term nutrient restriction during this small window of late gestation, just not even the full length of late gestation, but the last 40 days of late gestation can reduce how the calf responds to vaccination. So now we're going to move into the post-weaning growth and carcass quality. So I really wanted to highlight here why we are so interested in looking at this last trimester of gestation. It's because 75% of fetal growth occurs during the last trimester of gestation. Now, if you remember back to my graph on nutrient requirements, as we moved into the last trimester of gestation, we did see this rapid increase in nutrient requirements for the cow. That's because it, is, it meets with this 75% growth in fetal, or rate in fetal growth. So this rapid fetal growth demands more nutrients, so therefore the cow's energy requirements are higher. But not only do we see this rapid increase in fetal growth, but the last trimester of gestation is also the, when we have the development of really economically important tissues, including muscle and fat. So I first wanna start talking a little bit about muscle development. So to start, muscle development occurs in two different ways. The first is either through an increase in fiber number, and the second is through an increase in fiber size. And the second important thing to point out is that the fiber number is set at birth. So the prenatal development of muscle is extremely important because the growth of muscle following birth is done through the increase in fiber size, but not fiber number. So an increase in fiber size is, or sorry, fiber number mainly happens during this mid gestation period, during secondary myogenesis, which is the development of muscle cells. Then when we move into late gestation, where we focus a lot of our research is when we see an increase in fiber size, muscle fiber size. But this time period also coincides with a dipogenesis or the formation of fat cells. So by focusing here, we have the ability not only to influence muscle fiber size, and but we have the, also have the opportunity to influence adipogenesis. Therefore, we could also affect carcass quality, not just pre-weeding or uh, post-natal growth. So these were three of the original studies that looked at fetal programming effects in, um, in beef cattle. And these were again conducted in the Midwest regions of the United States in Bostor or Bostaurus um, influence breeds. 
So this looked at steer performance when cows were fed one pound per day of a crude protein supplement during the entire length of late gestation. And all of these studies, these three studies in the different colors here, they all had this, a very similar experimental design. So what we see when we provide just a small amount of supplement, just one pound per day of a crude protein supplement, we two out of the three studies found that feedlot performance was increased when um, cat, or steers were born to cows that were received a protein supplement compared to steers that were born to cows that did not receive a supplement. We saw the same thing with carcass weights. There were higher carcass weights in two out of the three studies when steers were supplemented, were born to the supplemented treatment compared to the control. And then in one of the studies, we see a shift in marbling scores and actually an increase in improvement in marbling scores. And this is what resulted in this shift in the percentage of steers that graded choice. So by improving our marbling scores, we were able to have more steers grading choice. So this kind of led to some other questions about um, what, is, what could be causing some of these fetal effects. So there was a group out at the Oregon State University and they wanted to look at, is it just having cows at a high body condition score or is it that gain in body condition score? So what we saw was that, or what they did was they looked at five different treatments and I have the first two here. So the first treatment was maintaining cows at a low body condition from the start of gestation through calving. The second treatment was having cows at a high body condition score and maintaining that through calving. Then their second treatment was a change of body condition score, a change of a 1.5 body condition score during the first trimester of gestation and then maintaining that through calving. The second was a change in body condition score during the second trimester of gestation and once again, maintaining that through, cal uh, through calving. And then the third treatment was increasing body condition score at the third trimester. So now we're gonna look to see how this affected calf weaning weights. So when we look at the weaning weights of the calves, the weaning weights were greater in calves that were born to cows that increased body condition score during the second and the third trimester compared, one, compared to um, cows that gained body condition score only during the first trimester. Now, if we go back to that figure that I just showed you where we look at muscle development, this makes sense. We increase their body condition score during that critical period of time when muscle cells are developing both in number and in size. But then it also increased weaning weights compared to cal uh, calves that were born to cows that were um, managed to maintain either a low or a high body condition score. And what I really want to point out is that even the cows that were managed to maintain a high body condition score had similar weaning weights to those that were managed to maintain a low body condition score. So therefore, it doesn't necessarily look like it's just keeping cows at a high body condition, but it's actually that increase in nutrient status that is causing some of these fetal programming effects. So from the results, from this study, you can really see that the increasing supplementation or increasing the nutrient status can affect the, can affect the postnatal development of the calves. So we kind of wanted to take this or take this and develop our question. We still really wanna focus on that last trimester of gestation, but now we wanna know, can we be more cost-effective in our supplementation strategy? So we wanna look at how the timing of supplementation during that last trimester of gestation influences the calf postnatal performance. So this study it was a two-year study that is part of my dissertation project. And we started this in um, 2017 and we um, just finished it now in 2020. So we had um, mature Brangus cows that were assigned to one of three treatments. Our first treatment was a control, which provided zero pounds per day of dry distiller's grains throughout the entire length of late gestation. So from day zero to day 84 of the study. Our second treatment is what we call the late 84. And this treatment provided 2.2 pounds per day 
of dry distillers grain supplement during the entire length of late gestation. So from day zero to day 84. But then we wanted to try a third treatment. And our third treatment looked at providing four and a half pounds per day of dry distillers grain supplement, but only from day zero to day 42. So it's concentrated in this first half of late gestation. So you might ask, why did we choose that first half compared to providing it at the second half? And the reason for that is because after weaning in July, the cow's energy requirements are at their absolute lowest. So our thought was that if we can concentrate that amount of feed in that first half of late gestation, we can be more efficient with our feed and further increase their body condition and provide more nutrients to the growing fetus. I really wanna point out here that cows on both the late 84 and the late 42 treatment were provided the same total amount of supplement during the entire length of late gestation. So between these two studies, we're not necessarily going to reduce feed costs because we're providing the same amount. But what we have the potential to do is reduce our labor in half. So if we can just feed during the first 42 days, we can potentially reduce that labor associated with feed. And then um, I would just like to point out again that after calving on day 84, all treatments were treated the same, or all cows were treated the same, and they all received uh, four pounds per day of a sugar cane molasses supplement. So first we're gonna look at body condition. So in the first 42 days of the study, which is here in September, so remember this is when the late 42 treatment was getting four and a half pounds of body, or four and a half pounds of dried distillers grains. And the late 84 was only getting 2.25 for the first 42 days. While they are both greater, they both have greater body condition scores compared to the control, there's no difference between the two. And we see this again at calving. They still have greater body condition score, However, there's uh, compared to the control, however, there's no difference. And this is maintained throughout the start of the breeding season, as well as through the breeding season and at the end of the breeding season. Now, when we look at cow reproduction, so looking at the calving rate, we wanted to look at both the first calf calving calf crop as well as the second calf crop. So when we look at calving rate and calving data of the study, there's no differences between the treatments, which was to be expected since we started supplementing them later in, into late gestation. But what we were really interested in was looking at their second calf crop. So we looked at the pregnancy diagnosis in May. And at pregnancy diagnosis, there was once again no difference in the percentage of cows pregnant, nor was there a difference in calving rate. But what we did find was that cows that were born, or sorry, cows that were supplemented for the first half of late gestation calved earlier in the subsequent breeding season compared to those on the control and compared to those that receive supplement for the entire length of late gestation. Now, this is really important because for starters, those cows are going to have older and heavier calves at weaning because they were born earlier. And it can also influence their, the following breeding season and they're more likely to breed back earlier in the following breeding season. So when we put these two things together, it appears that the best supplementation strategy for the cow was to only be provided supplement for the first half of late gestation because there was no difference in cow, in cow growth or body condition, but we had cows on the late 42 treatment having earlier in the subsequent breeding season, and we were able to reduce our labor costs. But now when we look at the performance of the calf, we get a little bit of a different story. So first, I would like to point your attention to birth weights. Um, so in this study, we did not see a difference in birth weights uh, between the three treatments, um, which I know is something that people can be concerned about. If we supplement our cows this close to calving, could we have problems with dystocia? And in this case, we did not have differences in birth weights and we did not have any problems with dystocia. Now, I would like to move to August when we wean calves at about nine months of age. So what we see here is that we can harvest an additional 16 pounds of weaning weight in calves that were born to cows that were provided supplement for the entire length of late gestation 
compared to um, calves that were born to cows that received supplement for only the first half. So this increase in 16 pounds of weaning weight would more than make up for the cost of the supplement associated with feeding for longer. And then when you look at it, the um, late 84, compared to the control, those calves that were born to cows that received no supplement, there's a 31 pound difference. So this significantly makes up for the cost of feed and the cost of labor to harvest that extra additional weaning weight at the end, or um, at the time of weaning. So if you are looking to sell your calves at weaning, it appears that the best supplementation strategy for you would be to provide supplement for the entire length of late gestation. So it's different from the calf. We were really fortunate in this study that we were able to uh, collaborate with Dr. Poor at North Carolina State University. So immediately, uh, steers were vaccinated at weaning and immediately following weaning, they were shipped to a feedlot at North Carolina State University. So we were able to look at the calf's response to vaccination. So we looked at bovine viral diarrhea virus and parainfluenza 3, which are two viruses associated with bovine respiratory disease. And what we see is that calves that were born, or sorry, steers that were born to cows that were provided supplement for the, only the first half of late gestation had a greater percentage of steers responding to vaccination, or sorry, um, that had a parainfluenza uh, three titers compared to um, those on the control treatment with the late 84 being in the middle. It was not different from either the late 42 or the control. So once again, when we look at immunity, it appears that um, the late 42 treatment may be better because we're able to still harvest more um, response and more antibody titers compared to the control. Now, we also followed these through the feedlot, so they were maintained on a similar diet throughout. However, we did not see any difference in feedlot performance, but we did see some differences when we looked at their carcass characteristics. And I would like to point your attention to marbling and the uh, percentage of steers graining choice. So when we look at marbling, um, the marbling scores, the steers that were on the late 42 treatment had greater marbling compared to the control with the late 84 once again being intermediate. And then because we have this increase and in improvement in marbling, we're able to alter their carcass quality grades and shift the percentage of steers um, grading choice and alter our quality grades. So when we factor in all of these together and we look at the feedlot and carcass performance, or sorry, if when we look at the carcass characteristics, if you're interested in improving that area, then you may want to think about supplementing for only the first 42 days of gestation, because that's where we saw the largest improvement in marbling scores and the percentage of Sears grading choice. So when we look back on this study, I think this study is really great because it really shows that how you manipulate the diet really of the of the cow really influences the calf. So if you're interested in looking at weaning weights, you may wanna provide supplement for the entire length of late gestation. If you want to improve your carcass quality, then you may want to focus and concentrate that supplement in the first half of late gestation. So from this, we can see that the best supplement from it may be based on your operations goal, and it may also not necessarily be what's best for the cow, because what was best for the cow was to provide supplement for only the first half of late gestation. So while I've been here, I've also had the pleasure of working on two different studies that look at supplementing methionine to grazing beef cows. So you may ask, why are we interested in supplementing methionine? So methionine is a limiting and essential amino acid for beef cows during late gestation, especially when they're grazing low quality forages. Additionally, methionine can influence the postnatal growth of the offspring because there are, there's evidence that it alters gene expression and can have an effect on um, muscle development. So this first study looked at providing methionine in heifers and it used 36 crossbred uh, Brangus heifers per year. And they were assigned to one of three treatments. 
The first treatment was no pre or postpartum supplement. The second was 2.2 pounds per day of molasses plus urea. And our third treatment was 2.2 pounds per day of the molasses plus 15 grams per day of a methionine hydroxy analog. So supplement began 56 days before parturition and ended when all heifers within a pasture had calved. Another thing we did here was we early weaned our calves on day 147 at approximately 89 days of age. And we, this is a common practice that we do here in Ona because it improves the breeding season for the heifers in the subsequent, um, the subsequent pregnancy and improves calving rates. But from a research standpoint, it's also really great because it allows us to manage all those calves similarly. So we were able to provide them the same diet to see what effect the maternal diet had on their postnatal growth. So first, we're gonna look at the pre and postpartum performance of the cow. So at calving, uh, heifers that were provided molasses supplementation, regardless of methionine, had greater body condition score compared to the control which is what we would expect to see. Um, we did follow them out and look at their um, reproductive performance in the subsequent breeding season. However, this was not the, our main focus of this study. Our main focus was to look at the calf performance. Um, so we didn't exactly have the numbers to find statistical differences here, but there is no difference in pregnant cows or the date of study for um, the subsequent uh, calving season. Now, when we look at calf feedlot performance, we took um, body weights at early lean, dry lot entry, and then when they exited the dry lot. And we see the same results at each of these time points. And calves that were born to heifers that were provided molasses supplementation had greater body weight compared to calves that were born to cow heifers that received no um, prepartum supplementation. So therefore, we're, we're seeing the same trend we saw in the last study where we were able to increase weight, body calf body weights by providing some sort of pre-calving supplement. Now, when we look at the immune response, once again, we see that calves that were born to cows provided, sorry, heifers provided um, molasses supplementation had greater response to vaccination for both um, bovine viral diarrhea virus, as well as parainfluenza 3. But once again, we see no difference when they're provided methionine. So this was in heifers. We then wanted to look at methionine supplementation in mature cows. So this study used 160 multi-parous Brengus cows, and they we wanted to look at two different factors, methionine, yes or no, and then the supplement type. So providing trace mineral or providing molasses plus mineral. So this resulted in four different treatments. Their first treatment was mineral plus a methionine. So 56 grams per day of mineral plus 15 grams per day of methionine and then mineral with no methionine. So just the 56 grams per day of mineral. And then our third treatment looked at molasses plus uh, methionine. So three pounds per day of molasses 56 grams per day of mineral, and then the 15 grams per day of methionine. And then our last treatment here in the red is molasses with no methionine. So it's exactly the same as the last one, except zero grams per day of methionine compared to the 15. And um, we did not see an interaction between these two factors. So we looked at them separately. And when we looked at them separately, we looked at supplement types. So comparing mineral to mineral plus molasses. And when cows were supplemented with molasses, they had greater body condition score at calving, as well as at the start of the breeding season. Now, when we add the addition of methionine, there's no difference in cow performance. And then once again, with our pre-weaning calf growth, we see very similar trends to what we've been seeing. At weaning, uh, calves that were born to cows provided molasses during the 70 days of late gestation had greater weaning weights compared to those that received no prepartum supplementation. And then once again, with the addition of methionine, we do not see a difference in weaning weights. So we're not sure why we did not see a difference with methionine. It could be the dose that we used, but 
but we did use the highest recommended dose of the company um, that the company suggests. Or it could also be that we're just not focusing on the right time of, of gestation. Um, we may need to look at providing it at a different time. Um, but the thing I really wanted to point out with these two methionine studies is that we're still seeing the same results with prepartum supplements. So regardless if it was a dry distillers grain supplement or a molasses supplement, we're still harvesting more weight at weaning in those calves, <clears throat> which I think is really important to point out. So based on these studies, we can come up with a few conclusions. So providing a prepartum supplement, we can enhance um, body condition score at calving, which can lead to cows calving earlier in the subsequent breeding season. It can increase calf weight at weaning. It can improve calf responsive vaccination, and it can also influence and improve our marbling scores, which can then alter our quality grades. So with that, um, my presentation is done, and I would really first like to thank our funding sources, which were the Florida Cattlemen's Association, as well as Zoetis. I would also like to thank my advisor, Dr. Moriel, and the rest of my committee for their support. And then I would also like to thank everyone here at ONA, particularly Julie, Tom, Ryan, Jacob, Austin. Um, without you guys, we couldn't do this work. So thank you for everything you do. And with that, I will take any questions. Mm -hmm. So there are some studies that look at comparing, like say a native pasture versus like an improved pasture. And they do see some differences in um, uh, uh, performance of the calves. So there are some differences when you look at forage quality that there can be an effect there as well. But a lot of the studies primarily look at um, providing either a protein or an energy supplement. That's where the majority of the work is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our question is, why did we choose dry distillers grains? So we wanted to choose a supplement that was high in both crude protein and energy. So dr the dry distillage grains provided about 83% um, total digestible nutrients and 33% crude protein. So we really wanted to find a supplement that had um, high protein and high energy. But as you can see, you can have some of the same benefits with different supplement amounts. So like our molasses is 70% total digestible nutrients compared to 20% crude protein. Um, so you can still see these benefits, even if you choose a different supplement. But that is why we chose the, um, the dry distillers grain supplement. So the question is, is there another amino acid that could be limiting? Um, so in most studies that they've looked at when they look at um, essential amino acids, methionine is not the only um, low amino acid, but it is the first limiting, in, especially in grazing cattle. So um, there is a possibility, but I think for our scenario where they were grazing, the forages they were grazing, it, methionine would be the first limiting amino acid. But that is something we could look at because we did not look at um, amino acids other than methionine in the blood. So. All right. So I do have a question here. Um, so I mentioned that muscle cell proliferation occurs during the second trimester and muscle fiber size growth and adipose tissue development occurs during the last trimester. So the question is, if you focus your research on the second trimester, would you expect to see differences from your research? That's a really great question. And yes, we would definitely see, I personally think we would definitely see differences if we focus the supplement at different stages of gestation. I mean, even within that period of late gestation, focusing it in the first half compared to the second half changed the outcome. So I think if we did shift it to the um, mid gestation, we would see somewhat different results from what we saw by providing it during the last trimester.
All right, so is supplementation economically viable in the last third of pregnancy? So based off of the data that we received, um, it would be economically feasible to provide supplement. And again, dry distillers grains is an expensive, more expensive supplement, but you could alter this and change it with a different um, supplement type. But with the, uh, and I think this also goes back to your operations goals. If you are selling your calves at weaning, you are harvesting additional weaning weight. So therefore that makes up for the amount of supplement. But we are, once we get all of this data put together and we have some other studies combined, we would really like to put together an economic analysis to really show that. But just based on these results, we do think it would be economically feasible. All right, I think that is all the questions I have. So thank you guys. Our next OWNA highlight is going to be December 8th, and that's going to be another graduate student highlight with Wes Anderson. Wes is a PhD student in the Wildlife Ecology and Conservation Department, and he will be presenting impacts of an invasive ecosystem engineer upon wetlands and aquatic communities across a subtropical agroecosystem. And he is advised by Dr. Raul Bouton, and he will be graduating in December. So look forward to that. And then in January, Dr. Brent Sellers will be providing a weed science program highlight presenting broom sedge management in the Haya grass pastures. This is a new program that we have just started advertising and Dr. Hans Ellington is gonna be providing it virtually on Saturdays beginning December 5th is the first session. Um, these are all sessions will begin at one unless otherwise noted. And you see the first three are labeled December 5th, December 12th, December 9th. And let me just read to you the little promo that they have. We invite you to join for an eight part series of virtual sessions with videos and live presentations beginning on December 5th and running through June, 2021. In this series, participants will learn about bluebird biology and ecology in Florida. They will also learn about the importance of nest boxes for bluebirds and how to construct, monitor, and maintain the nest boxes. Finally, participants will ride along with wildlife researchers as they conduct, in, conduct important research on blue bir bluebirds at the Range Cattle Research and Education Center. So the registration is on Eventbrite and there is no cost to attend. So highly recommend you check that out. And now the, the last event that I wanna mention is the American Society of Animal Science Southern Section Extension Committee has three more webinars remaining in their Livestock Genetics and Genomics series. These are held on Wednesdays at one o'clock. And this week on the 11th, they have Impact of Genetic Adaptation to Environment. The following week, the 18th, they have Genomic Testing in Dairy Cattle. And then after Thanksgiving on December 2nd, they have genetic selection of small ruminants. So that is all the announcements that I have. Again, thank you so much for joining us today.